My name is Lisa Raitt. I'm a recovering politician and I'm ready to start digging deep. Hi, Mark Sutcliffe. Welcome to Digging Deep, presented by Zen Books and Abacus Data. This is the latest in our series of one-on-one conversations with interesting, thoughtful, accomplished people who come from many different areas of life. We talk to television hosts, entrepreneurs, musicians, Olympic champions, and more. We dig into their stories, the challenges that they've faced in their lives, their defining moments, and we all get to learn from them the powerful, hard-earned lessons of their lives that we can apply to our own. We do that in a couple of ways. First off, we start with some rapid-fire questions and answers that allow us to get to know the guest, maybe in ways that we haven't before. And then we start digging deep into their life stories and life lessons. Our guest today is Lisa Raitt. Lisa Raitt has had a long career in business and politics, but she has recently become a champion for families going through Alzheimer's. That has become her story recently, and I'm going to get to more about that in a moment. Lisa Raitt was a member of Parliament for 11 years, served in three different roles in Cabinet, and was the deputy leader of Canada's Conservative Party. She began her career as a lawyer, then became an executive, and eventually the CEO of the Toronto Port Authority. Since leaving politics, She has been working as Vice Chair of Global Investment Banking with CIBC. Now, Lisa has had an incredible life story, and we're going to get into many details of that. She grew up in Cape Breton, and early in her life, she discovered that the woman she thought was her mother was actually her grandmother. And more recently, she has become a strong, candid, passionate voice for people and families experiencing young-onset Alzheimer's. Her husband, Bruce Ward was diagnosed a few years ago, and Lisa has been sharing her very difficult, very emotional, and very inspiring journey in a way that has really moved a lot of people. In our conversation, we talk about how all of these experiences have shaped Lisa's life and what she has learned from them. Lisa is very, very candid about what she's going through right now, living with a husband who is advancing through the stages of Alzheimer's. It is very powerful. It is also very hard to hear at times. Lisa also shares her insights about leadership and in particular women in leadership, in business and in politics and much, much more. One last thing before we get started. If you like what you hear, please subscribe to Digging Deep, post a review on Apple Podcasts or wherever you listen and share it with your network. And if you're looking for more information about this episode of the show, including links to some of the things we reference in our discussion, if you want to read my daily blog, I post every single day of the year with a short post, something that I've learned or thought about recently. Or if you want to subscribe to my newsletter, The Weekly Dig, which has five very quick items I want to share with you each week, then please go to our website. It's letsdigdeep.com. That's letsdigdeep.com. You can also find there a link to my TEDx talk. Now, let's start digging deep with Lisa Raitt. Lisa, it's great to chat with you. Uh, I've admired you and we've spoken before at different times during your political career, but not really since you've left politics. You just described yourself as a recovering politician a moment (laughs) ago, which is uh, very cool. Um, you've had a lot going on lately that you have shared publicly that I think has really inspired and moved a lot of people. And, and we're going to talk about that. I really appreciate you joining us today to, sh- to share your story. My pleasure. It's, I'm very happy to be here. So let's start with a few questions, the kind you never probably had to answer when you were in politics, Okay. <laughs> such as, <laughs> uh, what is your fondest childhood memory? On Boxing Day. The McCormick side of the family would gather and we would have the meal. The meal was always fine. It was the same thing, turkey and leftovers. However, we would have this ultimate card tournament at the end of the meal called SCAT. And SCAT, I think, is an East Coast kind of uh, card game. And we would play for money and my grandmother would clean up and uh, it would just be delightful because I learned how to trash talk there. House of Commons has nothing on the McCormick's ability to trash talk each other. <laughs> that sounds great. And cards are very big in, in places like Cape Breton, right? 
Yeah, actually, yeah, I, I grew up knowing how to play everything. 45s, hearts, tarbish. Um, I don't know if I can say this. It's a card game called Asshole, which was always a favorite in our families. We played everything and it was, it was a fun way to pass the evening, but it also facilitated communication now that I look back on it. And I've passed it on to my kids. My kids liked that scat tournament that happens when my family gets together. That's awesome. Who was your hero when you were 10 years old? When I was 10 years old, I was obviously in elementary school and my hero at the time was Alexa McDonough. Who was in a woman in politics and was she, politics, was she in yeah. provincial politics at the time? Yes. Okay. She was a leader of the NDP provincially, but it would be the first time that I saw a woman in politics. My family was involved in politics. They, uh, my grandfather was a union guy and he was a city councilor when I was born and my my uncle wanted to get involved. And as a result, politics has always been part of our, our discourse. And then all of a sudden there's a woman. So yeah, I wrote her a letter. And did you get a reply? I did. I also wrote Elizabeth May at the time too. Um, and she replied as well. I don't think she recalls it. And I'm sure she doesn't like being reminded that I'm that much younger than she is. But <laughs> yeah, I wrote her a letter when I was, uh, when I was in school about uh, Point Le Pro nuclear power plant. Okay. Very interesting. We'll have to come back to that. Uh, mm -hmm. So what did you think you were going to be when you grew up? Did you think politics? Really? Yeah, eh? I did. yeah, I did. I really did. I think I always thought I was going to be involved in some way. A lot of it because I, I have uh, the gift of the gab and I have the ability, you know, kiss the Blarney stone, that all that stuff. Good Cape Bretoner. But I was always told by my family, oh, you're going to be prime minister one day. I think everybody says that to everybody in their family, but I actually believed it. I didn't pursue politics, but I pretty much thought I wanted to do that when I grew up. So when the opportunity presented itself, I grabbed it. Right on. What is your life story in six words? I must look after my family. Okay. I like that. And it's That's it. more true than ever before for you. It is. And yeah. it's, a, it's kind of reflective of it, but it's, uh, it's very true. It's been like that since I was young. When I was young, it's been service has always been a part of service to family has always been part of my upbringing. What is a, a big mistake or your greatest mistake or some type of mistake you made that you learned from? What would you what would you I'm be willing to share? Oh, I can share and I'm learning from it now. And that is I had no financial literacy growing up. If money came into my bank account, I spent it. And when I say growing up, I mean, until this year growing up <laughs> and you know it's always been a bit of a of, of a of a black hole vacuum for me it, money goes in money goes out I didn't invest I lucky that I'm going to get a pension um and I regret and I think the biggest mistake I've made is not understanding money and how money can make money and how um, financial security really does matter to someone's life so I, I get a chance now to make sure I teach that to my kids. I've never had a problem making money. I've always had a problem spending too much of it. Mm. Wow. Well, that's, that's a big share uh, and, I'm a, and a really powerful lesson. Yeah. And I'm a conservative. Right. Yeah. <laughs> um, for what do you feel most grateful? Oh, my children, my children, that they're good beings, that they're good human beings. I'm very grateful for that. What has been the best year of your life so far and why? This year. Every year gets better. I'm, I'm an optimist. Um, I had new challenges this year. Uh, my kids are older and they are uh, becoming young adults and it's easier to talk to them. And I made a, a big career change, went from politics into business and it's stimulating. And, and then finally, COVID has caused me to slow down. And that's been good for me. Like I'm really getting my head together. That's great. Mm -hmm. What's been the toughest year of your life? 2008, 2009. Whole bunch of things happened at once. I was, I changed my job from the Port Authority into running for uh, the Conservatives and winning. I became a cabinet minister. My marriage broke up. I was living in Ottawa with two young kids at home. I had two major scandals happen in 2009 in the spring. It was a year that can break you. And it, it yeah, it, it was a, it was a heck of a year. 
I spent a lot of time in great amounts of uh, emotional pain that year. But you got through it, obviously, and, I did. and, and got stronger, I'm guessing. Yes, I've learned a lot of lessons from 2008, 2009. Have I forgiven myself for everything? Probably not. But that's why I think this year is a good year for me, because I'm actually taking a moment to reflect and understand the decisions I took back then and forgive myself a little bit for for the decisions I made. What one person has had the greatest impact on your life? Bruce Wood, my husband. And uh, because I am 52 years old and I'm thrust into a caregiving position that is completely new, unknown, and has really opened my eyes. In a lot of different ways, I'm sure. In a lot of different ways. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, emotional connections, human connections, stigma. I'm getting it all. I'm getting, it's like drinking from a fire hose in a sense. But So it's been very impactful. What's the most important lesson that you have learned that you would share with other people? On reflection, having a sense of humor and, and genuinely liking people is a good path to prosperity. I think that people like people who like them. And, um, I, and give people the benefit of the doubt. That would be the advice I'd give. You may get burned, but it oftentimes it pans out better for you. I totally agree with that. And it's so hard to do, but it's, it is so powerful. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, it is. What would people be most surprised to learn about you? That I fancy myself a bit psychic. Oh, okay. See, you're surprised. <laughs> yeah. Well, um, you know, I'm from Cape Breton, right? We believe in all that stuff. <laughs> Ghosts and goblins and stories and, and cool. forerunners and all that. Yeah, I'm, I'm well steeped in all of our, our folklore. Right so on. my office, my office knew this, the people who work for me. And I would say, I would say, you know, something doesn't feel right. And they'd go, oh no, what's coming? <laughs> And something would happen. And to this day, I'll call Andrew Brander, who worked for me for 10 years, and I'll say, I have that funny feeling something bad is going to happen. And uh, he just said, stop doing this to me. Stop calling me. Lose my number. <laughs> <laughs> I don't work for you anymore. <laughs> the thing is, if you, if you predict something bad is going to happen and you leave it kind of wide open, you'll always be right. Because <laughs> there always well, will be something bad that happens. It's something bad that happens in my life, I guess, is what I was right. trying. And I, without yeah. putting into the universe, because you don't want to say what it's going to be, because then it really will happen. But yeah, mm. that's uh, I fancy myself a bit of a fortune teller. I can read your palm, do some cards, that kind of stuff. Yeah. Back to the cards. Yeah. 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 What's your secret talent? Well, that would be, that would be the same thing. I, okay. as a party trick, I'll read your palm and, uh, you'll be freaked out. Okay. <laughs> I should hold it up to the camera. And, yeah. <laughs> it doesn't work. Doesn't yeah. work. Um, what's your boldest prediction for the future? That I, uh, that uh, what my boldest prediction for the future is that, um, there's a lot of uncertainty. I know that sounds really bizarre. I can't really get a, a, I can't get a bead on what is going to happen. I can't get a bead on, on what the future looks like. I think that COVID-19 has made things so strange that um, people are going to go through some psychological pain as we start getting vaccinated and feeling a little bit well. There's a lot of pent up emotion. How that is going to express itself, I don't know. Are we going to be a better society? Are we going to be a worse society? Haven't figured that part out yet. Uh, but I do have one, well, my bold prediction, it's not really that bold, is while people say they're not going to travel, they're going to travel. I mean, tourism and flights are going to go off the charts again. Yeah, I think I have this suspicion that when we are allowed to do things again, uh, we're going to rush back and things are going to get, many things are going to be a lot more like 2019 than we would have predicted in the middle of the pandemic. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, I would, I would agree. I would agree there. Um, I wish I could make the bold prediction that we're going to completely rejig our healthcare system, but I don't think we will. I mean, mm. 
if there's ever an opportunity to focus on something, it would be on the delivery of healthcare, including long-term care. What's been a recent epiphany for you? Discovery or something you've changed your mind about? Oh, um, I know I'm supposed to have all that. A lot, actually. That's why I'm pausing. There's been a lot of my eyes have been opened a lot now that I've taken a step back from politics and I take a, a bit more moment to breathe. Um, I think the epiphany for me is just how much privilege I have in my life. I think I, I grew up telling the story that, you know, I'm a poor girl from Cape Breton, grew up bottom of the street, grandfather was a coal miner, everything. I still have lots of privilege compared to what's out there. And I think that's the big epiphany for me this year. I got a real good understanding now of uh, the privilege I have, the privilege my kids have, and how much is wrong in the world right now. That's that's the big one for me this year. Yeah, that's a powerful lesson. Yeah. Um, what book are you most likely to recommend to other people? Is there a book that's had a big impact on you? You know, in business, yeah, Good to Great by Jim Craig is what I read. And I think that's just the best foundational piece of running uh, an organization and understanding human dynamics. I quite yeah. enjoyed it. It's old. It's an old book, yeah. but it worked for me. It's a great book. I just read it yeah. again for a second time this year. Yeah. It works. Yeah. It's, you know, he nails really good concepts. Yeah. All right. We're going to take a little pause. Lisa, I appreciate you answering all of those questions. In just a moment, we're going to start digging deep with Lisa Raitt. We're just going to take a quick break so I can tell you a little bit more about the presenting sponsor of Digging Deep, ZenBooks. ZenBooks is Canada's go-to cloud accounting firm. They are not your typical accounting firm. I know the founders, Colin and Eric. I've worked with them for several years. And here's why I think you should consider working with them too. First of all, they bring a fresh, unique, modern approach to what is a very old-fashioned industry. These guys were working remotely and in the cloud long before it became cool. ZenBooks also uses technology to your advantage. I think this is really important. They give you the tools and analysis you need to monitor your business in real time. That's so valuable right now when everything changes so quickly. Yes, they're a virtual accounting firm, but that doesn't mean they're offshore, and it doesn't mean they're inattentive. ZenBooks combines the efficiency and effectiveness of a cloud accounting service with all the benefits that you'd want from a trusted advisor, high-level advice, and strategic support. Now, here's what I think is going to happen if you work with ZenBooks. You'll probably start out taking advantage of their cutting-edge cloud accounting solutions, but in the long run, I think you'll stay with them because of their strategic guidance and problem-solving. Among their core values, they specifically list being candid and proactive. Isn't that exactly what you want from a trusted advisor? Look, even if you're already working with an accountant or a bookkeeper, or you have some accounting staff on your team, I think you should still talk to ZenBooks and learn more about their tools and their expertise. Check out ZenBooks at zenbooks.ca. That's zenbooks. Dot ca. Digging Deep is all about helping you make better decisions, and so is Abacus Data. Most leaders struggle to connect with and engage their audiences. Why is that? It's because they aren't sure how they think and feel and how they will react. Abacus Data can give you the strategic insights you need to make better decisions and to make them confidently. Here's a good example. A major national union was recently negotiating a new agreement for its thousands of members. This had the potential to be a very difficult process. There were many competing interests. So they brought in Abacus Data to conduct thorough and detailed research of their members to learn exactly where they stood, what they were thinking, what they wanted. And as a result, they were able to secure a strong new deal that was accepted overwhelmingly in a national vote. Abacus Data helps all of its clients understand what's really happening in the minds of their employees, clients, and stakeholders. They help them avoid costly blind spots. And they're really good at what they do. In fact, 
Abacus Data was one of the most accurate pollsters in the 2019 Canadian federal election. Make the one decision that will improve all of your other decisions. Let Abacus Data help you move forward with confidence and clarity. Go to abacusdata.ca. That's abacusdata.ca. Lisa, once again, it's great to have you on the podcast. I really appreciate you joining us. And we're going to talk about a lot of different things, including what you've been experiencing this year that you've shared publicly. Um, but let's start there because um, I think a lot of people have been touched by and, and moved by and inspired by your story. And you made a deliberate decision, obviously, to share it, uh, which, mm -hmm. which can't have been easy. Um, but let's talk about you and your husband before his diagnosis, because I'd like to, I'd like to know Bruce through your eyes from yeah. before this illness. Well, when I met Bruce in 2008, he was um, an all Canadian CEO. You know, he was just turning 50, had a scratch golf game and um, could fix anything that was broken could make you anything you wanted made in terms of woodworking, drove boats, drove planes. I mean, he was a guy, a guy, a guy's guy. And um, ran the, the Hamilton Port Authority, also had a, had a couple of CEOs before then. And just was, you know, was really, uh, how do I put it? He wasn't super sophisticated, but he was very assured and very calm and very knowledgeable. And I really liked the fact that for me on an intellectual basis, I kept learning from him. Like it was a real partnership and that was nice. It was very nice. We had common interests in business and um, I'm not a golfer. He could go do that on his own, but he was independent, um, thoughtful, uh, brought me flowers, bought me jewelry. I mean, he was just a guy. He was a really good guy, really good guy. And you had a relationship and you, and, and tell me about kind of how things unfolded and then what happened mm -hmm. when you discovered this diagnosis. So we moved in together in 2009 and around 2012 during the election, 11 was the, the election that where we won the majority. And in 2011, I could tell, uh, we were having, he was acting a little bit strange, meaning he was far more cranky than normal, didn't like loud noises around him, had a very short temper. And I thought to myself, oh my gosh, what have I got myself into? We moved in together in 09 and here we are in 11 and he's exhibiting all these issues. Was he hiding who the real he, you know, was he hiding the real Bruce Wood? And have I been snowed? What has happened? And remember, 08, 09 were terrible, was a terrible year for me in general. And then I'm in 11 going, oh my gosh, I made a huge mistake. I've made a massive mistake. And it was, uh, it was an up and down relationship. In 12, we bought a house in Milton and we moved up here into the country and he had his barn and he enjoyed it with all his tools and, and, you know, our relationship was good. It was good. There was still some, you know, tension in certain things. And then in 13, it really started to deteriorate. He uh, never wanted to go out. He didn't want to, he was mad that I would go out. He would call me in Ottawa on Tuesday nights and just be yelling at me about where was I and who was I with and what was going on. And it got to a point where it happened almost every Tuesday. And then he wouldn't speak to me again until Thursday. Um, during in 09 and 10, Bruce would come and pick me up at the airport. All of a sudden, he just decided he had no interest in picking me up at the airport anymore. He was jealous of his time with me. He wasn't kind to my kids. It was really getting worse and worse. And I really thought, okay, well, clearly I've made a mistake. And now I've got to have to start backing out of this relationship. I don't know how I'm going to do this, but I've got to, for the sake of my own sanity, take a look at how I'm going to get out of it. And then you fast forward to the election in 15. Um, and you know, he was terrible during the 15 election, bad with my parents. Um, here's an interesting story that I hadn't thought about in a long time. There was a smell in my house in 2014, 2000, a really bad sewer smell, like really bad, eye wateringly bad. And I would say, we've got to get it fixed. It's, and he would say, no, it, there's nothing, there's nothing wrong. It's a sump pump, nothing wrong. Refused to call anybody in to get it fixed 
fix, just absolutely refused. And then eventually I just called myself and the guy came and guess what? My sewage tank was cracked and leaking sewage all over into the field. I could smell it, he couldn't, but further, he just didn't know how to deal with it. So his reaction was to push back and deny it. So it ended up being a massive fight and it just was so odd. At the same time as I was experiencing these things at home, which I thought was just a marital breakdown without the marriage, but with the mortgage, he um, was having the same kind of issues at work and disappearing from the office, not making meetings. He was going to the airport and he had to take pictures of where his car was parked because he was losing his car at the airport. And then it got to a point where he wouldn't travel to see me in Ottawa by plane. And he wouldn't travel with work unless they had somebody else with him traveling. And I, I was very suspicious of that. I said, why do you keep taking people with you? What's going on? You know, all those kinds of uh, suspicions that a, a wife has when he's traveling so frequently with other people at the office. And it just turns out he just didn't, he was doing everything he could to hide the fact that he had lost executive function. So the board noticed it. Probably some complaints were made by staff and, um, they set about to do a performance review, which was the gearing up to fire him. But before they fired him, one of the board directors said, you know what, let's give him a chance to go and see if this is something medical. I don't know why he gave us that chance. I'm so grateful to Matt Mokio who did that, but Bruce went to the doctor and the doctor did one test with um, taking three items, showing them the items, putting them away, and then coming back later and saying, what were the items? And Bruce didn't have a clue. And immediately he was referred to an Alzheimer's doctor. The doctor, the family doctor just clued in right away. And that was when we got the diagnosis in 16. So at that moment though, any thoughts about leaving him, any thoughts about, you know, divorce, splitting the properties, that was all gone. Cause now I know why it happened. Now I know exactly why we were going through what we went through and the relationship turned on a dime and became an incredible relationship. But you could not have at his age, I mean, that just would not have occurred to you. Right. I mean, he, he was in his mid fifties, right. When all of this was. was happening. Yeah. 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 He would, he would have been 53 when he first started showing signs, 52, wow. 53, my age right now. Yeah. Mine too. And, and here's the thing, part of the reason why I'm talking about this is because there is a lot of sad stories out there about people who didn't have that board director who said, let's let the guy go to the doctor. And instead, boom, just got fired from a, from a, a senior position, losing disability, losing health care. And then two years later gets diagnosed with, with early young onset dementia. Like it's out there. So what I'm trying to express is if you're 50 and it's not just about forgetting things, ex executive function is gone, complete mood change, um, it's not depression. It's not andropause. Get him in there, get him tested for dementia and family doctors test for dementia. Even though he may not think it is test them for it. Luckily the family doctor Bruce went to was his golf partner. He knew him from golf and he knew Bruce was having a problem keeping score. Other than that, who knows, we'd still be waiting for a diagnosis maybe. Mm. So how did things change? And then, uh... What did you reflect on in terms of what you were now signed up for in a lot of ways? What, what did you think about mm. in terms of how you knew the next few years were likely to unfold? Mm. I had no, I had no, uh, just like now, Mark, I have no lead on the future. I have no line on what things are going to look like tomorrow. I didn't know back then. I don't know now uh, because there is nobody who went through that path ahead of me that has vocalized what it was like. We have a movie that's called uh, Still Alice that everyone refers to. And there's a couple of movies coming out and then there's some dramatizations you see on TV. None of them touch, none of them even come close to what you go through in young onset. First person that came out was John Mann. Remember John Mann, uh, the musician? Yes. So yeah. John Mann, the musician came out and talked about the fact that he had young onset Alzheimer's and his family talked about it. He's since passed away. But that was my first kind of recognition and realization. Oh, my gosh. This does not look good as to how this is all going to go. And we um, how did we cope? We cope by in the beginning trying to say we're going to beat the disease, hold it off. 
we'll take the medications, we'll do all that kind of stuff. And then you realize it just, nothing works. I'm not being defeatist. It is the reality of this disease. Over a period of time, it's just a decline. And at some points it's like that. And some points it's like that. Meaning some points it's a flat curve and some points it's a very sheep, a, a steep slope that you go down. And right now we're in a very steep slope of, of deterioration. But the first decision I made, which is the decision that we made together, which is one that anybody who has dementia diagnosis should do, is you get your wills done, you make sure your beneficiaries on RRSPs, all that stuff is all exactly where you want it to be because you are going to lose the capacity to make those life decisions for yourself sooner than you think you are. So get out and do the paperwork first, figure out your finances. Uh, anecdotally, Mark, um, once he, I never touched Bruce's finances, back to the financial discussion, probably why I'm so adamant about this. Uh, I never touched it. I never asked him any questions. You know, I assumed he paid all the bills. He hadn't paid our taxes in two years. That's a pretty big thing. That's a pretty big thing. Hadn't filed. I mean, obviously taxes were remitted at source, but hadn't filed. There were still some taxes that were, were owing that we're still working through now. But um, be prepared to step in to take over all of the stuff that you didn't think you had to ever worry about. But you have to worry about two people in this scenario, obviously. There's the care for Bruce and mm -hmm. and the path that he's on. Mm -hmm. But then there's you and the fact that you are are now, your life is dramatically affected by this. And, mm -hmm. and, uh, and can you tell me how you kind of handled both of those things uh, because yeah. you, there's a lot there obviously. And there's, there's, you know, it, it's a, it dramatically changes the course of not only his life, but yours, that diagnosis. It does. Yes. Well, um, one of the first things that ended up happening as a result of Bruce diagnosis was I made the conscious choice that I was not going to do as many community events as a member of parliament as I used to do. And I took my foot off the gas did that lead to my defeat in 2019? Probably, probably. So has Alzheimer's impacted us in my career? Absolutely, yeah. I would sit there and I would think I could go to this event that's gonna have about 45 people at it, or I could spend a good Saturday night with my husband that I'm probably never gonna get again. And that was the calculus every single time. And my staff would say, um, you know, Lisa, you gotta, gotta go to more events, gotta get out there, gotta see more people. And I would just say, uh, what would you do when you know you have a finite amount of time with the person you love? And that was an easy decision at the time, but it did have ramifications. Adam came in, he saw that there was a gap. He worked really hard, went and saw a lot of people, did a lot of FaceTime and convinced them that it was time to give somebody else a chance. And that's what happened in the election. And am I sad about it? No, because I don't regret those choices I made to spend those Saturday nights with Bruce. I don't, but it is, uh, it is a side effect of this disease. So I expect and anticipate that there are gonna be other ways in which my career path, my, my health, my uh, mental health, physical health are always all going to be negatively impacted because of the fact that I'm caring for somebody with this young onset Alzheimer's. And that is the fact. You did decide to get married though, mm -hmm. uh, a along the way, right? So tell me about that decision. Well, it's really funny because Bruce always wanted to get married throughout our entire relationship. And I always said, no, and it's, and what's really funny, I used to say to him, well, if you want to get married so badly, why don't you go organize it? And the funny part is now, I now know he couldn't organize it. Like he lost executive function, but he really, really wanted to get married. Um, and I reflected on that after the diagnosis and I realized what he was craving was security. He just wanted to know that I wasn't going to take off if there was anything, because he knew something was wrong. He didn't know what it was. He was freaking out. And then finally, when he figured out, when we figured out what it was, I think he was afraid that I was going to go. And I said, okay, let's get married. And then six weeks later, pulled it together, got married in Cape Breton at my sister's house. That was easy. That was an easy decision, you know, and uh, I had really good friends in Ottawa who just took over the planning. <laughs> <laughs> That's nice to have. Yeah. 
But what did that mean to you? And what do you think it meant to him? It meant to me that any decisions that would be made regarding his care would be firmly in my hands and that I knew exactly how I was going to make those decisions. And what it meant to him was we had a great party and his entire family showed up. All of his sisters and brothers got together and it was one of the first times and last times they did. They came from Jacksonville, Edmonton, Montreal. It was really great, all out to Cape Breton. So what is it like for you day to day now? You've shared mm -hmm. some of these experiences on social media. It's, mm -hmm. it's obviously been very, very hard. Can you describe what your life is like? Yes. I want to start by saying that the things that people need to understand about young onset Alzheimer's is it is rare, that it is different depending upon who gets it, that the, there are no drugs that, are, that can be used to treat it. Any treatment of any symptoms are being done on an off-label basis, meaning they're hoping that it's going to work. Drugs react to people differently in different situations, and there is no medical literature on how to deal with any of these symptoms, which means nobody knows anything. And that every day when you're trying to deal with these, what, I, what are called neuropsychological behaviors, it's like throwing darts at a dartboard and you're hoping that the mix of medicines that you're using that day is going to take away the symptoms. So that's what I wanna let people know first, why it's so hard to get it under control. But let me tell you about the symptoms because I think people will, should understand that too. Yeah, but I'm going to jump in, Lisa, because I, yeah. I think that's a really important point to make. You're basically, you're kind of thrown into this situation without any sort of handbook or set of yeah. rules or, or you know, if <laughs> in case of emergency break glass, you know, there's yeah. there's nothing there. It's a, it's kind of like a, it, you're you're playing a board game where you don't even know what it says on each square and yeah. and what the rules of the game are. It's exactly it. And I'm talking about a very specific point in this in this uh, stage of, of Alzheimer's. There are seven stages. The first four, you probably wouldn't even realize somebody has Alzheimer's. You get into five, you can see some deterioration. We're in stage six. Stage seven is the last. We're heading out of stage six into stage seven. And it's stage six where you end up getting these behavioral psychoses if you get them. And normally you do get them in young onset. It is common. And one of the more common things that bind, bind them all together, which is terrible for anybody out there who is listening, who is in stage four to know that this is something that is in the cards possibly for them. Uh, this is the part that I was the most unprepared for. I had no knowledge of. I didn't believe it was going to happen. There are no movies who tell you about this. There are no books that tell you about this. But you know who tells you about this? The caregivers tell you. And to find them, you've got to go online on chat groups where they will share with each other to try to figure out who's on what and how it's working and is it helping. And then... The other place is getting your own system uh, caregivers within the Ontario health system, which is really difficult to put a team together to go on a wait list. I went very public. I had a I had a 911 call at my house back in May. I talked about it. I told my GP. I had my first consultation with a geriatric psychiatrist yesterday from May. Okay. And so that means from May until December, I should have been, I would have been dealing with all of these behaviors without medication. However, I did have a neuro, neurosurgeon, a neuro, um, neurologist at Baycrest who is doing it for me. So we've been in a treatment phase since July. Are we further ahead? So here, I'll tell you what the, the word, my day starts at eight o'clock at night. <laughs> okay. My day starts at eight o'clock at night when Bruce takes his pills for the night. And my goal is to get four hours sleep. If I get four between eight o'clock at night and eight o'clock in the morning, I'm a happy girl. 
I don't get four hours sleep. What we do get is he is up and roaming around, taking clothes off, putting clothes on, fighting with bed sheets, growling at who knows who is in the room, breaking ornaments, uh, taking food out of uh, freezers and leaving it all around, doesn't leave the house. I'm very lucky he's not a wanderer. But in amongst all that is me standing behind trying to catch to see what is going to happen next. So the goal is twofold. One, to reduce the aggressive outbursts where he would punch or kick hit or hit me, which we've been somewhat successful in. And the second one is to get him to sleep through the night, which we have been completely unsuccessful with. And every day, the next morning at eight o'clock after I've made it through those 12 hours, which I dread every single day because I don't know what's going to come at me. It is terrifying. You don't know what you're going to get overnight. I wake up the next morning and I uh, report it all. I diarize it. I look at the cameras to see how much he wandered around the house, what he did when he was wandering. And then I call his doctor, call in the symptoms. They call me later and they say, okay, well, out of the 11 pills he's taking now, let's move this one to 25 milligrams and we're gonna move this one down to one milligram. And then I make all the changes in the pill boxes and I administer them and then eight o'clock comes again. And then I administer the drugs. I monitor what happens overnight, try to deal with it, make sure it's not violent, diarize it, call it in and then wait to hear, and then we start the day again. And in the meantime, I got to work, I got two kids, try to decorate for Christmas, look after him, make sure he feed, he's fed and, and deal with his behaviors during the day. And there's no end in sight. Wow. There's no end in sight. This is the way it is. He's not gonna be accepted by any facilities if he is aggressive. So I might as well just hunker down and try to figure it out. He's losing his ability to walk. So he shuffles a lot and falls. I can't lift him. So we're gonna to have to deal with, we'll have to move a bedroom down onto the main floor, I think is the next step. And uh, you know, all the good stuff, refuses to get a shower, refuses to brush his teeth, fights with me about all that. So in amongst all of that, <laughs> yeah, you live a life. Yeah, tell me about exercise and diet and mindfulness no there's no time <laughs> there's the book that is you're, on you're not alzheimer's. meditating for an hour every morning lisa <laughs> no, come on no come on the book lisa. on alzheimer's <laughs> is called the 36 hour day the 36 hour day is what the book is called and it's true and it's true but it look this stuff happens in stage six going into stage seven i know it's a finite amount of time and my goal is to make it out of the other end alive like not figuratively like literally alive yeah. I, I'll, I'll share with you last night, for some reason, this happens to me about once every three weeks, I wake up in the middle of the night and I can't go back to sleep. So I get mm -hmm. up and I do things and then I try to go back to bed. And, you know, I'm a, I'm a little bit of a mess today, but that's one night that, I, that I've been through that. And you're living that every single day. How are you coping with that? I, ironically, the body adapts, Mark. This is one thing that I've learned. I say that to myself too. How am I functioning on four hours? But I take a power nap in the afternoon. So I've got caregivers that come in on Monday to Thursday between 10 o'clock in the morning and three in the afternoon. But that's just so I can work. Like that's just so that I can actually, you know, pay the bills. Um, and then at three o'clock, I'll just say to Bruce, I'm going to lie here and I'll take a nap in front of the television for an hour. And he'll let me have about 45 minutes before he wants me to go off and do something else. So my nap is important. Um, I get when he first goes to bed is when he gets about the first hour and he'll stay in his room for the first two hours between eight and 10. And I'll get some, I'll rest then I'll, I'll watch some television um, if it's good television. And then, you know, during the night, you just cat nap as much as you can. But I have not slept through the night in two years. It's like having, like when you had children, right? Mm -hmm. When you have a baby, same, same kind of impact on you physically. And yeah. Yeah. And, you know, yeah. his, this, his doctor has said that if you want to compare it to where he is mentally, he's about a four-year-old. But he's a four-year-old who's 6'2", 250 pounds. Mm. Now... You mentioned for the most part, you've managed the aggressive behavior and the, yeah. the, and the violence, but have, yeah. have you, have there been incidents? Oh yeah. Yeah. Um, this morning 
you know, I wanted him to get in the shower and I wasn't as gentle. I wasn't as patient as I should have been. And as a result, you know, he'll grab your arm and he'll hold on to it really, really tight. And it's just because he has such strength, it does end up being scarier. Um, and, and now it's, we still uh, share the same room. And it's funny because he wants to get some sleep. And now at 6.30 in the morning or five, actually 5.40 in the morning, he'll just uh, literally start shoving me out of the bed, like pushing me out. Now that's not aggressive or violent, but it's, uh, it is, uh, it is what it is. Yeah. It's, it disturbs your sleep, if nothing else. It does, but it's not, yeah. it, it's not what we had yeah. before. We had punching before where he would fi find me in the house and punch me, but that does not happen now. Okay. So we've gotten to a good space. And, you know, the, the doctor that I spoke to, um, I asked him, when, when do these outbursts really get under control? When are we back to normal? Like, tell me when it's going to happen. And he said, it'll never be normal until he can no longer physically maneuver to do it. And I went, wait a second. So when he becomes completely, you know, non-ambulatory, that's when we have this cessation. And he went, yeah, pretty much. It's when, when patients are in wheelchairs. <laughs> wow. And that's the, that's the answer. That's the answer for, you know, 16,000 Canadian families out there who are going through this. And it, the majority of them are men. The majority of the, of the people who suffer from young onset are men. Mm. So I, I saw you quoted recently saying that you thought you could barrel through everything in life, but you're starting to reach your limit. Um, yeah. How are you feeling? Um, how are you coping? You know, are you just taking it day by day? Is what's your approach? Yeah, hour by hour, eight o'clock by eight o'clock. So, what are you learning from this experience? If you even have time to kind of observe any sort of lessons, as opposed to just kind of being in the moment all the time, because it's so immediate, it's so present tense. Well, I'm, I'm, my first emotion is I have so much gratitude that I have the healthcare plan that I have, that he has the healthcare plan that he has, um, and that I have the experience in understanding at a high level what needs to happen, because that makes it a lot easier. I cannot imagine my mother dealing with this in the same way that I'm dealing with this. And um, that's a little bit scary for me for all those families out there. I, I have a really good uh, group that I talk to on Thursday nights. And I asked one of the women whose husband is around the same area as mine now, um, what was, what's been the biggest change for you? She said, the biggest change for me was when then I just realized this is the way it is. And I just have to get through it. Much like my, I can barrel through everything in life. I can't barrel through it. I have to let it happen, but I can get through it, but everything is different and I can't wish it for to be different. I can't wish it to be some way it's not because the forces of this disease are far stronger and greater than anything I can throw up in response. There are just, there are no tools. But that's a big adjustment for you because you were a business leader and then you were a, a politician, a, a cabinet minister. You were, mm -hmm. you were accustomed to fixing things and to throwing all these resources and energies and solutions yeah. and all of that and saying, OK, let's let let's solve this problem. Right. And this is a problem you can't solve. I can't solve it for him. I can't fix the problem for him. But the problem I can fix is the silence around the issue and the lack of understanding around the issue and the lack of information. So I chart everything. I'm a really good charter now. And if what I put together serves as a path for somebody else coming down behind me, one of the other 16,000, then I feel that I've accomplished something. And that means I fixed a problem along the way. And I've used the skills that I have in order to make life better for, for those that are, are gonna be going through it. I mean, it's information, take it for what it's worth, but it's still a lot better than wondering what's going to happen every night at eight o'clock. And is that why you're being so candid about everything that's happening and sharing it publicly? 
I think I am. I think I think it's the crossover of a member of parliament knowing when a voice needs to be amplified and looking at the, the help boards and reading about the pain on the Facebook postings from all of these women looking after their husbands around, you know, Australia, the UK, the United States and Canada. I just felt that there needs to be uh, an amplification of these problems because everyone's dealing with it in their own little silo because there is no information. It is a rare disease. They don't have drugs that are meant to cure the problem. Um, and then don't even get me started about care, right? I can afford to pay for it. There are, there are women out there who are doing this 24 hmm. seven who retire early because they have to. Yeah. And that's one piece I can keep is my job. I can keep my security of, of position and I keep my career like that's going to continue on. So health may go to the wayside, exercise, diet, all that stuff. But work is not touchable for me and my relationship with my children, not touchable. So you kind of weigh it all out. And I rationalize this all the time, Mark. You can see I think about it all the time. But if I don't, I can't let the sheer um, enormity of the problem take away from the fact that you need to find a path through it. You seem incredibly strong. and But at the same time, I know there must be enormous emotional baggage and pressure and highs and lows that go through, go with all of this. Yeah. There's a, well, Christmas isn't a great time of year because, you know, you wish things were a lot different. Uh, there's a Mariah Carey song that came on, not the, not the one you're thinking of for Christmas. It's a different one that she sings. Um, it's not coming to my mind right now, but it was playing on the radio yesterday when I was driving with them. And, you know, I just started to cry because she talks about that. I miss you most of all at Christmas. See, I get a little bit teary. I miss them. Yeah, of course you do. Yeah, so that's the side of it that when you're not being the, uh, the chief contractor in terms of how to deal with all the moving parts, that's a side that you don't dwell on, but it's there. Yeah. But you do have this job, right? You've got all these tasks to perform. I've got a job. And yeah, that's yeah. And that's yeah. the that's the key. But it, it does creep in. And it's okay though to feel that emotion. And it's okay yeah. to show that I'm upset by it and, and you yeah. know sad about it. But it's okay. It's okay. Obviously I'm getting help in terms of counseling on this side too. I I need my help. I need my help. Yeah. Yeah. Well, you are incredibly strong and very inspiring. And I really admire you for sharing this experience because I think it will change other people's lives and, and make more people aware of, of, of the reality of this, this kind of situation yeah. for so many families. I hope what I can do, Mark, is I can reflect and go back over the, all the stages that we've gone through and at least try to write down so that people will understand what Bruce needed at every different stage. And is it something that's provided by the state? Is it something that's provided by the person? Is it something that's provided by society? Uh, and then just, you know, write that path forward for other people. Um, and that's why it's important to document it now and to just, there's enough information out there to put the hand up to say, if you've got somebody in your life who has this enormous burden that they're carrying, reach out to them and just say hello. You don't even, listen, I don't want you to stay for an hour and visit with us, quite frankly, but an email saying, how's it going? Perfect. I don't have time to put the tea in the crumpets out. <laughs> we got other shit going on in this house. <laughs> yeah. But it's nice to know people are thinking of you, right? And that's, yes. yeah. Yes, exactly. Yeah. And I may not respond to you, but I, I will respond to you a year from now and be grateful for yeah. the moment that you spent a year ago. Um, but yeah. Can we talk a little bit about some other aspects of your life too? Because I... I uh, yes, I'd like yeah, that. <laughs> yeah, that would be... I mean, <laughs> this would, is... Yeah. That would be delightful. Yeah. Um, 
you thought that you were the youngest of seven children, but mm -hmm. you, f you found out that uh, that you were actually the daughter of the person you thought was your sister and that you're the, the people you thought were your parents were actually your grandparents, right? Can yes. you can you talk about discovering that and what that was like in your life? Sure. It was very uh, it was <laughs> it's a jarring experience. Um, I don't think it's uncommon that, uh, you know, somebody gets pregnant in the family and then the, their mother and father decide to raise them. Uh, so her grandparents decide, right? What is uncommon though, is to drape this absolute cone of silence over the fact that you're being raised as a sibling when real and being passed off as a sibling, when really everybody knows that you were brought into the world. The only person that was uh, kept in the dark was me. Everybody else around me knew, and I was the only one that didn't. It, and it didn't offer protection to me. It didn't protect me from anything. The secrecy was there so that people could ignore it. It wasn't there to protect anybody. So with that as a preface, when my grandfather passed away in 1979, um, that was, and I was 16 years, no, I wasn't 16, I was much, I was younger. Anyway, I was, I was young, I was 11, I was 11. I, that's when the pronouncement that I was not allowed to know who my real mother was, was no longer written in stone because he was the one that demanded it. So he passed away and about a year later, uh, my birth mother and her husband, not my birth father, sat down to tell me the, the truth about what was going on. And, you know, those images are burnt in my mind forever because you're being told something that you kind of go, what? Um, okay, I'm very confused. I'm very confused now. Uh, but uh, I think they felt they needed to do it because I did not have a good relationship with my grandmother. And my grandmother was, um, you didn't quite know what she would do. You didn't know what she would do regarding me. And the jury was out whether or not she wanted me to be around after my grandfather had died. It turns out she did. But I think they just wanted to to let me know. And that just kind of turned everything on its ear because I really don't feel like I have a place of, I don't know if I'm the oldest of four or the youngest of seven or an only child. Like I'm everywhere. <laughs> I'm every woman. I don't yeah. know. Um, but wow. where I landed on it now, after all this time is I'm happy to be included in all those families. And I have no, I have no regrets. It is what it is. People made decisions that they made and uh, I turned out okay. So the person you thought was your father passed away and then yes. your sister sits you down with her husband yeah. and yeah. says, I'm your mother. Basically. Yes, literally those yeah. words, I'm your mother. Like no preface, no, there was nobody, <laughs> nobody took any courses on how to break that news. <laughs> <laughs> Ugh. And you didn't suspect anything? I suspected I, I suspected I was adopted but I, and maybe, maybe somebody in the family, because I looked like them, um, but not a, not, never did I expect it was Dolores. Never, never, never. Mm. Cause there was no real emotional connection between she and I as siblings. Like she just, cause she was told to stay away from me by her parents, yeah. which must've been heartbreaking. What you said about secrets. I, I imagine that, that the vast majority of family secrets are, not to protect the person that you think you're protecting. Mm. Uh, that's been my experience with them anyway. But yeah, it's very true. So we live, we live a very open life. Um, there's a reporter, uh, Roger Smith, who used to work at CTV. I was yeah. his date. I was his date on the very first time I came to the Hill for the parliamentary press gallery. And he reminds me every time he talks to me that we were 15 minutes into a conversation. I just blurted out my whole backstory. And I guess the reason being is I wanted to control the narrative. I didn't want anyone else to be controlling my secrets and I didn't know what he knew or didn't know. So I thought, okay, let's just put this on the table now. Mm. So I kind of live my life that way. I don't, um, I don't hold a lot in. It's not like I get out there and, you know, emote all the time, but I don't, uh, I'm an open book. Good for you. That's important. I, I decided at a certain point after I became a father that I wasn't going to yeah. lie to my kids about anything important, you know? Yeah. Bingo. Just, Me too. Yeah. You know what? The, 
my life's a little bit messy and they learn that that's better than pretending it's perfect or, or I took a straight path to where I am now. It's true, isn't it? Yeah. I've got a, and it's funny. My kids always test me on stuff. They'll say, well, what about drugs, mom? Did you ever do drugs? It's like, buddy, you're just barking up the wrong tree here. Right. You, <laughs> I know I'm open with you, but I'm not, I'm also not uh, I, go talk to your aunts. Don't talk to me. <laughs> I had, I had a lot more going on in my life than that. So your grandmother uh, was also a business person though, right? Is that right? In a way, I would classify it as small business, but it was not sophisticated business. So she, uh, there was a big bingo game uh, that was put on by the men's club of the parish of, of Holy Redeemer. Uh, mind you, these bingo games would bring in $10,000, like tens of thousands of dollars in a night. The, there were six floors of this bingo hall filled with people smoking and dabbing on uh, their bingo markers. And she ran the canteen. So she handled the stock. She did the inventory. She paid the pop boys. She, you know, she did all that. And uh, so she was a small businesswoman in that yeah. sense. Do you yeah, think that had, had an impact it. on you? Yeah, I do. Um, absolutely. I mean, I've never thought that I could not not do anything. I, all too many negatives in there, but it's never, uh, how do I put it? Yeah, there was never any question in my mind that there wasn't an appropriate role for a woman in any business, science, law, you know, law court, medicine, any of that. I, uh, we, you could do anything. Women ran the show. Right? It's a matriarchal society in Cape Breton. They handled the money. The men went on the boats. They went into the mines. Mm. They went in the steel plant. Yeah. And women handled the money. I just wish I handled it better. <laughs> <laughs> um and can you describe your journey out of cape breton because uh it, a big part of it, it was education right and that that took you yeah. to some really interesting places yeah it was uh the there was never a question in my mind that i would be leaving cape breton the question has always been was how long was i going to be away for jury's still out on that uh eventually i'll get back there but the the reality is is that i uh, the life that i wanted i wanted a professional life and for me to do that, I just didn't see a path in Sydney. The people who were the doctors and the lawyers and the accountants all came from the other side of the overpass. And I came from Whitney Pier. And I figured I was going to have to go abroad in order to make my, my name known. And that has proven to be the path. I do not believe I would have been invited into politics if I had been brought up in Cape Breton, if I had stayed and had my career in Cape Breton. I don't think so. I think I had to go away in order to become a minister, in order to do the things that I've done to get the job at the bank. Um, so my path was do as well as you could in school. And at the time, science was chosen for me because every mother wanted a doctor because doctors made the most money. And who doesn't want to have a doctor in their family? And I, it took me a long time to realize that I was going to be a, was not in it for medicine and did a master's in chemistry, wrote the LSAT and the MCAT, decided whatever I did better in, I would be, and did much better in the loss, in the law test than I did in the uh, medical admission test. And uh, yeah, went to law school, uh, saw a scholarship that I thought was really interesting, which was to practice in England for a year. I took that, I won. I was really happy to win that, studied in England for a year. That was really life-changing and came back and rest is history. From Whitney Pier to London, right? I mean, that's yeah, pretty cool. Yeah. Yeah. And for those I, people who don't know Sydney, I mean, it, there, there's a bridge, right? That divides yeah. the main part of Sydney from Whitney Pier. The working class and, neighborhood. Yeah. Yeah. And the steel plant is near, the old steel plant is near there, right? It's in the pier. Yeah. 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 So that's the, it's the melt, Whitney Pier's the melting pot. It was recognized as being one of the most culturally diverse places. And the reason being is that that's where everybody moved to work in the Coke ovens and in the steel plant. So yeah. that's where I grew up. I grew up like literally next door. Like there's a steel plant, a fence and my house. <laughs> that's where I live. That's where I grew up. Wow. Yeah. And from there, you were able to do amazing things. You took on all these leadership roles and, and you've done some amazing things in your career. And it, it, you said a moment ago, you never felt limited, uh, even though not a lot of women, still nowhere near enough women 
have had these kinds of leadership roles in, in a society where we prize equality and we value it and, and it is important. Um, mm-hmm. uh, and everybody, you know, even though we acknowledge it, it still doesn't happen enough. So mm-hmm. from your perspective, what are we missing here? What, what's stopping us from having more women in leadership roles? Um, the opportunity. I find myself in this part, my new chapter in my career, falling into what I view to be the worst mismatch of men and women, and that's in banking. So I first was in a port, I was in law, right? And everyone well, was in science first, and they say there's not a lot of men and women. And, the, and the, you know what, in my, uh, my class, it, it was even, it was 50-50, men and women, there wasn't, there wasn't a problem. And then I went on to law, and it seemed to be fairly decent in terms of how many men and women leadership positions that women partners were there, women judges, you could see all that. And then I went into transportation and we were able to, I became a CEO and then there was another one, another woman became a CEO in Halifax and you know, it all opened up around the same time. So there's women CEOs who run airports, who run ports. Uh, I did the same. And now I find myself in politics, you know, women cabinet ministers in high, it was the first female Minister of Transport in our country's history, which is a big deal for me. And I enjoyed uh, very much being the only woman on the wall of all the guys. And then, and now I'm in banking and I find this one to be the worst in terms of the lack of women. And I, I don't know why it's gonna be a study for me. Now there are some, it's funny, it's, I should speak specifically to capital markets um, because the bank at CIBC has, uh, I think it's 50, 50 in terms of its senior, senior management, it's Exco. Um, and they have, there's no question that they, that inclusivity, diversity are, are really bedrock for CIBC, but in capital markets in general, I look around the room. I don't see a lot of me. Like I don't, and I didn't come in traditionally, like I came in from the outside. So I've got to do a little thinking about why aren't enough women making it up through the current to get to the top of capital markets? Like what's happening to them? Where are they going? And so I like the new challenge to try to figure it out. And if it's because they need mentoring, I can't mentor you in capital markets, but I can mentor you in relationships and I can introduce you to everybody that I know. But it's definitely getting better out there. But it, but utilities, infrastructure, um, those areas are being run by women more and more, and that's a good thing. Uh, it's capital markets, finance side. We gotta have more strides, and we need more women in finance. Well, yeah. we we do we do want this, right? We know we want equality, um, but but knowing it is not enough for it to happen, right? So. Um, yeah. So we need, we got to change something, right? Yeah, we do. We do. And, and I'm going to try to figure out what it is. I don't think it's because of lack of um, warmth of welcome. I do believe that women are welcome in capital markets. They're not choosing it. So my son's in second year at McMaster. He's taking finance. His roommate, one of his roommates, a woman in business, taking finance. She absolutely hates it. She's going to go off and do marketing instead or accounting. So right in that moment there, she's making the choice that she doesn't want to do it. So we've got to figure that part out. It's, it's not only about how you go upstream. It's about getting in, getting more of the cohort to actually take the, the courses at the very beginning. I think it's just as important as STEM, to be honest, to have more women in finance, because that's yeah. where decisions are made, Mark. I mean, you may want to have us there doing the discoveries and stuff and the engineering, but I want women making the financial decisions. And the only way that's going to happen is if we start in university and get them in finance. That's a great point. Um, now that you've been removed from politics for a time, um, what, what are your observations about it? What do you think you learned from that period in your life? I prefer the term emancipated. <laughs> What do, we've been we've uh, been talking about all this serious stuff uh, because of your circumstances and because of that your sense of humor has not really you know <laughs> in other time to- in in other circumstances there would have been a lot more of that kind of that kind of humor yeah so what uh, what do I learn well I'm gonna tell you 
<laughs> I didn't think it was true and I thought we were whining, but it's really tough for conservatives to get a fair shake. I will look at a speech that's given, and I'm not, I'm not a partisan hack anymore. I will look at a speech that's given or comments that are made, or I'll look at a roll of tape and I'll see what's being said by it. And then I'll see how it's reported and I'll say, wow, you didn't need to take that point of view. You could have cut somebody slack on the comment. You really could have. You could have looked to see whether or not the motive was there. But instead, there's this gotcha attitude with conservatives. And maybe we bring it upon ourselves because we're holier than thou. I don't know. But boy, the gotcha side of politics for conservatives is strong. It's the strong force. But that being said, there's also a huge disconnect between what's important in Ottawa and what's important in the, uh, in the colonies. <laughs> so I'll refer to us now out here in the suburbia GTA and not a lot gets through. I can identify an issue now. I'm still close to all those guys uh, up in Ottawa and um, especially Candace Bergen and Michelle Rempel. And I will only call them to tell them when stuff is broken through the water cooler. Right. Right, the proverbial water cooler. What is broken through? And they'll be the really surprised. The stuff that's gotten outside of the bubble. The in, bubble, in yeah. Parliament, in the parliament. And has precinct. resonated, yeah. yeah. And what has resonated with people. And they'll say, really? And I'll say, yep, they get it. Well, what about this? No, they don't care about that. And part of the stuff people don't care about is democracy. Hmm which is so weird for me because I, you know, I've been steeped for so long in the love of everything that happens in parliament and the importance of holding to account on both sides. And, uh, you know, just to hear some people say, well, why don't you give them unlimited power? Really? What could go wrong? A lot can go wrong a lot and will go wrong because people lose perspective in Ottawa. So those would be my, my big takeaways, mm. stuff that used to seem so very important wasn't and stuff that is important isn't on the other side. I want to come back to something you said earlier about giving people the benefit of the doubt and, yeah. and showing people that you like them. And, you know, I, I've actually learned that very recently that one of the, and it's so, it's so incredible when you think about it, but one of the best ways to build a relationship with somebody is just to show them a bit of love and respect. Right. And mm -hmm. it's amazing how much people like being around other people who show them some love mm -hmm. and respect. Right. And yet mm -hmm. it's, it's a, a difficult thing to do. So can you just talk about kind of how you've learned that and how you apply it and, and, and yeah. Yeah. It's Dale Carnegie, how to yeah. win friends and influence people. I mean, it is his truism people like people who like them it stuck with me a long, long time ago. And I just always, I've, I made the choice to utilize that in politics instead of picking fights to try to be friends. And how has it worked for me? Um, I have a reputation of being viewed as, even though, even though I was a conservative, whatever the heck that means, I was still, I'm still viewed as one of the good ones. I don't, again, I don't know what that means. I reject all that notion. But what it does mean is that I, I did show respect for folks along the way. And, you know, I, there is one regret that I do have in the House of Commons. I was in mid tirade and I knew I shouldn't have said it. And I said it and I accused the Minister of Justice of lying. And I, I knew better and I immediately apologized. But I look back on that and I go, I was I was looking for some some attention that day or something along those lines. And I saw the look, it was, it was, um, it was Jody Wilson Raybould. And I saw the look of shock on her face when I said it. And I thought, yeah, cause that does not, it doesn't jive with what, who I am or how I speak. And I just you know, decided I wasn't going to go down that path again. It just wasn't a good fit for me in terms of, of, uh, of being that uber partisan. Yeah. And um, you said something else about trusting people and giving them the benefit of the doubt. And I, I think that what I've discovered is that uh, the risk in that is so much smaller than the reward. And yet mm -hmm. we kind of view it as the opposite, right? That you, that you shouldn't trust people until they earn your trust. 
Mm -hmm. uh, but in fact, if you actually trust everybody, once in a while, you'll get burned by that, but you'll probably influence people to be more trustworthy by trusting them. And you'll get so much more than you give up in that equation, I think. You do. You get more out of it. And I think I approach it from the point of view that if you have to keep score of everything going on all the time, it can be exhausting. So let's just trust them to get it done. I, look, I hired a pack of people who did the job of being distrustful of everything around me when I was minister, right? Don't trust this person. Don't trust that person. They handled all that for me. But on my side, if uh, somebody wanted to have an off the record conversation, Robin Sears, who is a, um, a lobbyist in Ottawa, told me this story recently. And he had a client when I was minister of transport and this client came in to see me and I gave the client an idea of legislation that I was going to be introducing that would have an impact on their sector specifically, a significant impact. And it had been coming for a while, but I was going to tell them how it was going to impact them and I wanted them to get out ahead of it. The contents of the meeting appeared in the Globe and Mail two days later, front page report on business. And I was annoyed and Robin sees me at a, at a function in Ottawa and he makes his way over to talk to me and he says he was trying to catch my eye and he did. I stopped mid story of whatever story I was telling some people around me and I turned to him and I poked him in the chest. I said, you, you tell your client that's the first and last meeting you ever get with the Minister of Transport. Now, I may have been a little bit more verbose in terms of how many curse words I put in there, but nonetheless, Robin said he walked away thinking, you know, I'm going to have to tell my client not to trifle with this woman again, but I, I trusted them and I got burned. But the, why I tell you the story is I forgot about the story. I mean, I guess I recall it happens now, but it doesn't stay with me. Like, yeah. I don't think to myself, oh, that son of a gun, those guys breached my trust. No, it doesn't stick with me. It's kind of like in the moment, did they ever get a meeting with me again? Yeah, but it wasn't nice. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it was for a period of time that they didn't get to meet with me. But it's, uh, yeah, I, I do trust until, until I'm burned. Yeah, which is better than not trusting until someone's earned it because that, you know. It's exhausting, Mark. Yes, yeah, no it's way to exhausting. live. Yeah. No, it's exhasting. You got to yeah. prove yourself over and over again. Yeah. It, uh, I'm going to share this story, even though there may be reasons not to, but like one of the, 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 one of the things I observed with you was this moment where Elizabeth May was up speaking at the parliamentary mm -hmm. press gallery dinner. And she was, you know, I'll just say it. She was going on way too long. Right. And, and you went up there and you very, and this is somebody who's, you know, not a member of your party, but you're all, you, you mentioned earlier you wrote to her this letter. I didn't know that part of the story, but you're all part of the parliamentary family. And you got up there and you very sweetly and compassionately and even kind of lovingly sort of dealt with the situation and got her to wrap it up and move on. And that's, you know, I really respected that. And it, it really told me a lot about you, that little, that little moment. Well, thank you. Uh, the flip side of it is a member of the NDP told me that I should learn to keep my nose out where it wasn't belonged. <laughs> well, there'll always where, be somebody, right? In, in yeah, Ottawa. But, yeah. But Megan Leslie did say, Megan Leslie said to me, you can have all the wine tonight, Lisa. That was fantastic what you just did. Okay, Look, well, that's um, good. There are two reasons. There's two reasons. One, Bob Ray told me to do it. And number two, <laughs> which is a true story. Number two was... Um, she wasn't helping women in politics. I don't want that to be the clip hmm. of women in politics. She's a female leader in our country. I'm going to protect her. I don't care what her uh, her political affiliation is. Anyway, yeah. she didn't. She she thought I she I don't think she views it as the same way I do. Okay, and not the same way I do. Okay, no, she was fine. There's nothing. Yeah. There's nothing going wrong in Liz. Like Liz. <laughs> I wasn't going on that long, Lisa. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. yeah, you were. You were. Well, let's not get into the kinds of things you were saying. Yeah. Um, well, listen, uh, this has been a great conversation and, and you've shared so much. And, and uh, I know a lot of people, I've heard a lot of people talk about how grateful they are for the fact that you are uh, sharing your story and, and opening people's minds and, and, uh, creating so much understanding about 
early onset. And, um, and I think it's going to make a huge difference in, in our perception of this illness and, and what families go through. And I know it's going to lead to change. Um, so thank you for what you're doing and thank you for sharing the other parts of your life story as well. I really appreciate it. My great pleasure. And if there is, you know, if there's a reason and a purpose why our family is going through this, then the best thing I can do is to try to figure it out and help the ones that are coming next. And that's why I'm diarizing everything. And it's never, the impact on the family is horrifying, but the impact on the individual is just, you've never seen anything like it, you know? Yeah. So let's make their lives as comfortable as possible. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you for what you're doing and thank you for your time today. I really appreciate it. My pleasure. Thanks. I have to tell you, I was very moved by this discussion with Lisa Raitt. Something that you didn't hear is that we were interrupted a couple of times, once by Lisa's husband, Bruce, and she responded with so much love and compassion, and once by his doctor, who called to do exactly what Lisa described in the interview and that is prescribe a new mix of medication to treat Bruce's specific symptoms. It really underscored for me what Lisa is going through every single day. She talks about not being able to sleep through the night, taking it four hours at a time. That really had an impact on me. And I've been thinking a lot about this conversation. It really resonated with me when Lisa talked about how she can't let the enormity of the problem take away from the fact that she must find a way through it. I also love what Lisa said about how Genuinely liking people is a path to prosperity. So many great insights and lessons from a person who is right now just fighting through every single day. So once again, a huge thank you to Lisa Raitt for sharing her time with us on Digging Deep. If you enjoyed this episode, please review it and share it with others. That's going to help us produce more great shows. Now, if you want to keep digging deep into topics and lessons like this, if you want to see the show notes, from this episode, if you want to subscribe to our weekly newsletter or read my blog, you can do all of that at letsdigdeep.com. That's letsdigdeep.com. Thank you very much for listening. Yeah.